Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can't tell me what to do. Where do you come off telling me that I am wrong? Mind your own business. Who made you the judge of me? Why are you acting all holier than thou? Why can't you preach something more positive instead of always talking about sin? Have you ever heard somebody talk this way when they were confronted by their sin or offended by the pastor's sermon? Chances are good that you and I have actually said something like that ourselves. We don't like to be told that we're wrong. We don't appreciate other people butting into our business as we see it. Many of us operate by the motto, live and let live, because tolerance has become the cardinal virtue of postmodern America, a wonderland of sin in which anything goes, including gay marriage, aborting babies, and doctor-assisted suicide, among many others. But as a Christian, if you speak out against these evils, people are quick to misquote Jesus and say, judge not lest ye be judged. Pointing out other people's sins is perceived as impolite. It's an offense to the libertine spirit that runs rampant in our country. In America today, there's no greater evil than to appear intolerant or bigoted. However, people are going to define that term tomorrow. And yet, in our Old Testament lesson today, the Lord God Yahweh affirms Ezekiel's call to be a prophet in these words. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, and you will have delivered your soul. Yahweh appointed Ezekiel to be a watchman for the house of Israel. In the ancient world, most cities had city gates and walls with a watchtower, and the watchman's job, whether it was day or night, was to look out and perceive whether there was danger on the horizon. And if a watchman saw that the enemy was approaching the city, they had to raise the alarm. They had to blow the trumpet. They had to raise the shout so the people could prepare to defend themselves. If a watchman saw the enemy coming and warned people and they didn't do anything about it, then their destruction was their own fault. But if the watchman saw the enemy at the gate and did not raise the alarm, yes, His countrymen would die, but it would be his fault. And so too for Ezekiel. His prophetic role was to warn the wicked of their sin so that they could repent and be saved. Just as the watchmen of a city stayed alert for enemies and dangers, so Ezekiel was supposed to keep watch over the souls of the nation. As a spiritual watchman, he had to warn his fellow Jews about the danger of their sin and God's coming wrath if they did not turn away from their adultery, their oppression of the poor, and their other sins. Because Yahweh is holy, he takes sin extremely seriously. Unrepentant sinners are doomed to death and damnation. But God does not want anyone to die for their sins. Jesus wants all to be saved. As he said in our gospel, it is not the will of my father that any of these little ones should perish. And as the Lord spoke later on in Ezekiel 33, as I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live, turn back. Turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Our loving Lord is a good and gracious God, and he promises that anyone that turns away from their sin and returns to him will be saved. He shall surely live, declares the Lord. And that's why Ezekiel's calling was a matter of life and death for both him and for his hearers. If he ignored their sin... If he turned a blind eye and kept quiet, they would not have a chance to repent. They would not have a chance to live. 
They would die for their sins, but God would hold their sins against Ezekiel as well. He would put himself in spiritual danger if he said nothing about the sins of the flock that was under his care. And so today, God calls pastors, parents, and even the government to speak against the sins of others. In our epistle, for example, we learn that the government is God's servant, God's minister. It says that multiple times in Romans 13. And the job, the basic function of government, is to punish evildoers for their sin. To provide order in society by restraining evil. And yet, because we now live in a disordered world that calls good evil and evil good... Our government now makes laws that conflict with God's law. And so it's even more necessary for pastors and parents to step up to the plate and to call sin, sin. It almost goes without saying that this is not one of the functions of the office of the holy ministry that we are extremely eager to carry out. It is tempting for pastors to avoid major issues. Or only to talk about sin in a generic way that is less likely to offend your hearers. Because as soon as you start talking about specific sins, people get uncomfortable. They begin to criticize the preacher, wondering why he can't be more tolerant. Why he can't get with the times. St. Paul warns that in the last days, people will no longer endure with sound teaching or good doctrine and that they will accumulate for themselves teachers and preachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. In other words, people want pastors to tell them things that just make them feel good. But my calling is not to flatter you. My calling is not to entertain you. Like Ezekiel, I too am a watchman charged with the oversight of your souls. No wonder then that in the New Testament, one of the most common words used for pastors is overseer. Overseer, one that watches over, that looks over God's flock. The Bible instructs pastors to keep a close watch. See, there's that watchman idea. Keep a close watch on yourself and the teaching. For in this way, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I heard one pastor once say that, The pastor's job is to afflict the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted. To afflict the comfortable with the preaching of God's law and to comfort the afflicted with the preaching of the gospel. My job is to hold up the mirror of God's law to your conscience so that you see your sins, so that you can stop sinning and cry out to Jesus and say, Lord, have mercy on me. And when you do, he will. Throughout the New Testament, the apostles writing under divine inspiration command pastors to rebuke sinners and castigate those who refuse to repent. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience in teaching. This is just one verse of many that gives that example. But did you you catch that word rebuke? According to the dictionary, rebuke means to express sharp disapproval or criticism of someone because of their behavior or actions. Sharp, sharp disapproval or criticism is what God expects from pastors to preach from the pulpit. And so when pastors preach, it's not just a matter of personal opinion or private interpretation. We preach the word of God. And if Yahweh gives us a word to speak and we do not speak it, then shame on us. So if one of my sermons offends your pride or upsets your conscience, the Lord will actually reward me for doing my job. And hopefully he'll use that to lead us to repentance. I'm a watchman over this congregation. And for me to do otherwise would be a violation not only of my ordination vows, but Jesus calling on my life to abdicate the pulpit to tolerance or to the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, would be to make alliance with Antichrist and to be complicit in your damnation and mine. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, not all who say, Lord, Lord, will be saved. And on the day of judgment, there will be those who will say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? 
And he will turn to those preachers and say, I know you not. This is a dangerous calling that I have. Parents also are charged with a terrible office. A terrible office of serving as watchmen over their children's souls. The Bible clearly teaches that parents have primary responsibility to teach their children the faith and to help them to know the word of God. And yet all too many parents turn away from their children's sin instead of calling them to repentance. There's all kinds of examples of this. We all know about the way that youth sports and other activities take over and crowd out the time and and, and the place that families should make for family devotions and public worship. And so we allow our children to despise the word of God. But it even happens when our kids grow up. They fall in love and they, they move in with someone before they're married. They cohabit. They shack up. And we justify it by saying, well, at least they love each other. And, you know, at least they're not sleeping around. And these are just a few examples of many ways in which we're willing to ignore our children's sin for the sake of a false peace in our families. I realize that many of us think that we're doing the loving thing when we don't confront other people's sin. It's not the case. If you saw a car driving towards uh, a cliff and you know that the bridge was out, but because of the weather, you know, they can't see that, they can't see the signs, would you be without fault if you just let that person keep on driving and plummet to their death? Or would you have a responsibility to wave your arms and maybe even throw rocks at their car? Do whatever you can to get their attention to say, Whoa, buddy, stop. There's danger ahead. Would you not be at fault if they kept going and you said nothing and they died? Well, dear friends, America is about to drive off a cliff. We've stopped listening to the word of God. We love the honor of men more than we love Jesus. We seek the opinions of people more than we seek the instruction of God's word. And are we really willing to let the people that we love go off a cliff just because we're worried about offending them or being branded as a bigot? What about judge not? Well, when you look at Jesus' words in context, you realize that Judging people is not the same as talking frankly about sin. Jesus says, yes, deal with the log that's in your own eye before you deal with the speck that's in your brother's eye. And yet he does not preclude us from helping our brother with the speck. Jesus says in another place in John chapter 7, judge with right judgment. See, Jesus does not want us to condemn other people for their sin. But if we condone their sin, we abandon them To the final judgment. Galatians 6, chapter 1 says, Brothers and sisters, if if any of you is caught in any kind of sin, then let those among you who are spiritual restore him in a spirit of gentleness. In other words, if you see that somebody is struggling with some kind of sin, talk to them about it in a gentle way, yes, but they need to know. And that verse ends, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. God does not delight in the death of sinners. He longs for us to turn from our sin and live. And that's why he sent Jesus to preach that message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus wants us to turn away from sin and turn to him for grace and mercy. Repentance is a matter of life and death with eternal consequence. Jesus takes sin so seriously that in our gospel we heard him say, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Because it's better for you to go into life crippled, lame, or blind than to enter hell with your body intact. And I know that we're quick to, you know, just write that off and just say, oh, Jesus is just talking with hyperbole, and, you know, he doesn't really want us to do that. But what Jesus wants us to be willing to do is to go to whatever lengths are required to turn away from our sin and to return to him. Jesus takes sin deadly serious. So seriously that he died for our sin 
on the cross, pouring out his lifeblood, pouring out his life so we could have mercy and forgiveness and life with God. Jesus died to forgive our sins, not to excuse them. Jesus died to take away our sin, not to tolerate them. If a wicked man turns from his sin and does what is just and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. May everyone that we love, including ourselves, turn away from our sin and turn to God for the mercy he so readily and willing, willingly gives to you. In the name of Jesus, Amen.